fun. Right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our CAMBAM QLS QLS CAMBAM seminar series. Um, it's a pleasure, real pleasure, to have Carson Stringer here with us. Uh, she's visiting from, uh, well, she's virtually visiting from HHMI John Elia Farms Research Campus. And um, Carson did her bachelor's in mathematics at the University of Pittsburgh, where she worked, already we started, got, was working on neuro, neurobehavioral work with Jonathan Rubin. And then she did a PhD at University College London, working in Kenneth Harris's lab, the Karanjani Harris lab. And then she started, had a brief postdoc at HHMI with Marius uh, Pajitari, who is on the who is on the first slide here. And then she started her own group, became a group leader, and started her own lab at HHMI, where she's focusing on a variety of computational methods and um, computation-based research uh, and uh, um, on, on a variety of systems. And uh, her her work is very well cited and recognized, and she is the developer of some very important tools for especially specifically for calcium imaging analysis that's used widely across the world. So over to you, Carson. And if there are questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your, raise your hand in case we see it. And of course, of course, there'll be time for questions afterwards as well. Thanks. Thanks for the nice intro. And, and yeah, and thanks again for inviting me. And yeah, please ask questions throughout. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted. It's better to, to ask them on the spot. Um, so yeah, thanks again uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm a group leader here at HHMI Janelia Research Campus. This is a picture of the campus here. Um, so I run a joint lab with Marius Pakitsaru here. And so we have postdoc positions in your lab if you're interested. And also I was saying before, there's group leader positions available at Janelia in, in all departments, including computation and theory, which might be interesting to some of you. And there's biology and neuroscience here. Um, okay, and so I'm gonna be talking about our tools face map and raster map today. So. Atika Saida, a really talented grad student in our lab, led the face map project, and then Lin Zhang collaborated heavily on, on both of these projects. And Lin Zhang is a, a talented postdoc in, in our labs. Um, and yeah, so I'll get started. Okay, so we can now record populations of thousands of neurons using two-photon calcium imaging, uh, shown here, or with electrophysiology using NeuroPixels probes. With NeuroPixels probes, for example, we can monitor whole brain activity. So you can see these probes are all over. This is a picture of the mouse brain. And so we can get uh, pictures that look like this, which is a raster plot of neural activity. So this y-axis here is neurons, this x-axis is time. And these little black dots mean when the neurons are firing. Um, so we've sorted these neurons so that correlated neurons are put next to each other in this plot to try to see some structure. And so that's our raster map algorithm, which I'll talk about a bit later. And so what you can see is that there's a bunch of coactive neurons um, throughout this recording in the brain. Um, but this mouse isn't doing anything technically. It's just in the dark. Um, there's nothing for it to see or, or hear or anything like that. Um, so what are basically we were wondering what is kind of the mouse thinking about when it's kind of in the setup, uh, which we call kind of spontaneous activity where there's no external stimuli. Um, and you can see that there's many different groups of neurons firing. So we this activity is multidimensional. So in order to predict this activity, we need a multidimensional predictor. And so for that, we turn to the mouse's face. So you can see this video of the mouse face. Um, this is what the mouse looks like during one of these recordings. It's not just, the mouse doesn't just stay still the whole time. It runs, it whisks, it sniffs, it grooms. And so we thought we could use these various behaviors to predict this neural activity. To do this, we took the principal components of the motion energy. So we can take the difference between frames, take its absolute value, and then compute the principal components. And this is what these principal components look like. You can see like a whisking uh, area here is red, um, sniffing more in this principal component. And then we can use these principal components across time to predict the neural activity. And we get a picture that looks like this. And so what you can see is that we're able to predict a lot of this neural activity uh, using the mouse's face alone. And so what we concluded from the study was that, what is the mouse thinking about? Basically, it's thinking about its facial movements. And so we were excited by, by this result that there was this widespread uh, representation of behaviors across the mouse brain. But we wanted to understand, um, basically, I mean, because the brain is putting so much effort into these representations, really, we want to know why is the entire brain driven by these spontaneous behaviors? Um, I'm not going to, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for to this question today, but we've been trying to answer to this question by creating better models of behavior and neural activity. And so we're 
we, uh, with this, we can try to figure out which behaviors drive neurons, what are their time scales, and also how are neurons representing behaviors. And we're hoping that answering these initial questions will hopefully help us figuring out why these behaviors drive neural activity in sensory, motor, all these different areas, and what their role is in, in cognition in the mouse. Okay, so to understand which behaviors drive neural activity, I showed you that we were looking at these mouse face PCs, so these here, but they're, as you can tell, they're not super interpretable. Uh, so what we turn to instead, we're tracking key points on the mouse's face. So for example, whisker key points, eye key points, nose key points, and mouse key, uh, mouth key points. And we wanted the, our tracking to be fast, so we used, um, a unit architecture, which is this kind of small network here of uh, convolutional layers of downsampling and upsampling convolutional layers um, that are connected by these skip connections, which enable the transfer of, of kind of um, higher spatial resolution information. That's really the advantage of, of these unit architectures. Um, and we so we created this small network to be fast uh, for tracking these key points. And also we wanted this network to work across a lot of different data sets. And so for any of you who've done some deep learning, you might know that a, a deep learning algorithm is only as good as the training data you give it. So really what you need is you need a lot of training data from lots of different angles uh, and lots of different mice, for example, to make a model that's actually generalizable. Because if I just show this, this model, the same mouse face from this, the same view and the same mouse, it's only gonna work well on that mouse, basically. That, that's, um, that's what will happen. So basically we created this training set with lots of frames and lots of, uh, in lots of mice and use this to train our neural network. And now what we want to do is hopefully we can take this neural network that's pre-trained and use it on any mouse that we record from in our lab um, out of the box. And so that's what we looked at next. How well can this um, neural network predict the key points on a new mouse that the algorithm's never seen before? And this is what the tracking looks like. And so you can see it can reliably track key points on the whisker, nose, um, eye. Here, the, there's no blinking in this video, but I'll show blinking later on. So the, we can tr track these different key points. Um, and what we found was we, uh, with this small unit, um, we were able to get an error of less than four pixels. And our inference speed is 300, over 330 hertz. So basically that that's fast enough to really do closed loop experiments where you detect that there's whisking going on and you can trigger optogenetics or other stimuli that people like to do in neuroscience experiments. Um, we compared this, uh, this uh, performance to other neural networks. And so Deep Lab Cut uh, ResNet 50 is a very popular algorithm for tracking key points and it does very well. You can see the error is, is pretty close to face map. It's not quite there, but it's very close. Um, but it's uh, two times slower than the face map architecture because it has like many of these layers um, that we think for specializing for tracking faces, we don't need all of that, all of that extra, all of those extra layers that you need to make a general network like Deep Lab Cut is, which works in lots of different situations. Um, Deep Lab Cut has a faster version, but we found we couldn't get that faster version to perform as well as our face map network. Um, and then we also tried another algorithm which has a UNet architecture like ours, um, Sleep, and we also couldn't get it to perform as well as our face map network. Okay, so we think we've created a very fast and accurate key point tracker for, um, for the mouse face. And so then we want to see what kinds of behaviors does the does the uh, tracker capture. And so, for example, I showed you, I told you about blinking. So when the mouse blinks, we have these key points. Uh, we have the X key point is the solid line and the Y key point is the dash line. You can see it moving as the mouse uh, opens and closes its eye. You can track whisking. Um, so generally we recommend, I mean, if people are tracking key points on the mouse face, you want to go at ideally like 50 hertz. That's what we're going at. Um, 30 hertz will be a little low, which is also common. But at 50 hertz, we can actually see these whisker oscillations that happen at up to 10 hertz. We can see them going back and forth. Um, the nose, the sniffing happens as the mouse sniffs a lot as well. And so you can capture sniffing with these nose key points moving up and down. And so um, you can use all of these key points to relate them to neural activity or other things that you're doing, or you can summarize them into a, into a few variables, like you can summarize running 
You can take key points around the eye and make an eye area, um, just a single eye area trace. You can look at whisking, just summarizing those three key points by their movement this way and this way, and then the nose uh, like this with this. Okay, so now we have kind of these interpretable behaviors of whisking, uh, nose movements, um, kind of blinking and things like that, and we want to know how these are represented in the neural activity. So that's what we're going to do next. Are there any questions up till here? Seems not. Okay. All right. So now we're going to take these uh, behaviors and try to predict neural activity. So to collect neural activity, we use this uh, technique that I told you about earlier, this two-photon calcium imaging, which basically, so here's where we're recording in this example here, this visual cortex area of the mouse. And you can see all these different neurons blinking. And whenever the neurons are blinking, that means that they're firing. Those, so we're capturing the neurons firing um, in, in these recordings. We have two, um, we're using this large field of view microscope that allows us to get this large area. We also have an upgrade to our microscope, which allows us to basically capture two planes, one on top of the uh, other in visual cortex simultaneously. So we're capturing like upper layer two, three and lower layer two, three um, of the mouse uh, visual cortex in this example recording here. And then what we can do is we can take uh, each of these, we can take these blinking light of basically what look like blinking lights and find the actual cells that um, that are driving them, kind of segmenting each of these little blinking things. And that gives us these cell masks here. So you can see each of these different colors is one of the cells that we detected. We do this detection um, with our algorithm Sweet2P, uh, which Suresh was referring to earlier um, as one of the tools we develop. And this allows us to automatically detect 50,000 cells. So you never have to circle 50,000 cells in your recording, which is a good thing. Um, and then we basically take the sum of the pixels in a, in a given cell mask at each time point, And that's going to give us our time traces for each neuron. And then we're going to now take these time traces for each neuron and relate them back to uh, the, the uh, behaviors. And so for this, um, the first step we could do is try a linear model from key points or from those reduced behaviors to neural activity. And so um, we can have a, the first layer in our encoding model be just a, what we did was just a linear layer here. And then we uh, have a, so that kind of makes new variables out of our 22 key points. And then our next layer is a temporal convolution layer. And so this results in spatiotemporal filters of these key points. So these are similar to the sorts of filters you might be familiar with in, in sensory neuroscience, um, like in visual or auditory neuroscience. Um, and then following this step, we add an output linear layer, which predicts the top 128 neural activity PCs. So this is PC1 through 128 shown here. And so the principal component is the color, and then the prediction is shown in gray. So we're predicting these 128 PCs because they summarize the neural activity well. Um, so you do principal component activity to get these uh, to get these traces here um, because single neurons themselves are noisy. So we've tried fitting this model directly to all 50,000 neurons, but that doesn't work as well as basically predicting the neural PCs and then projecting into the the neurons with the with the corresponding. Um, other PCs that the neural PCs basically uh, across neurons. These are the, the PCs across time. Okay, so we can take first, the first step is kind of, all right, so we have this linear model. One nice thing you can do with a linear model from behavior to neural activity is you can create receptive fields like we do in, in uh, sensory neuroscience. So what we did was um, basically you can define a, a, the way you find receptive fields as the stimulus, which maximally drives the neuron. So you have these features, which in this case are various behaviors that I showed here. And we're going to try to find the combination, kind of a little uh, temporal snippet of behaviors that best drives a, a neuron, um, that, that maximally drives it here. And so I told you single neurons are noisy. So to do this, we don't do this on the single neurons. We resort the neural activity using raster map. So this is neurons by time, where each of these little uh, lines in this raster map plot is not a single neuron, but it's the average of 50 neurons with very similar activity. And so that gives us something that's 
a little less uh, noisy than fitting single neurons directly. And so what we do is we take each of these, what we call super neurons, these 50 average neurons, and we find the behavior that best drives those neurons, kind of this, this maximal point using our, our linear encoding model that we fit on the previous slide. And so if we do that, we can get what I'm calling these behavioral receptive fields now, where, so we have kind of, the, this. these are examples, this line here is an example for this neuron here. And so let's look at this neuron. Um, so this is, Neuro, this is the running speed of the mouse up here. You can see the neuron, this neuron along this gray line is very active when the mouse is running. And you can see if we look at the behavioral receptive field, indeed it's driven by the mouse is running. So this little snippet is high. That, that's the kind of behavior that drives that neuron the most um, based on our, our modeling. And so you can kind of look across these different neurons, see different things. The neurons at the bottom of the plot, you can see especially these ones down here are driven by the offset of running. So these neurons are more active when the mouse isn't running. So you can see these time periods here. Um, you can look at these things in a lot more detail, uh, but just briefly, we can look at the summary, which is where we've made it into colors now. So basically red is high and blue is low, just kind of a, making a picture instead of these little uh, lines here. And then we can kind of see the organization across this whole plot. And really what's what's the biggest effect we, we saw was kind of the whisking. So a lot of these neurons uh, you can see are, are, are corresponding to forward deflections of the, whisk of the whiskers. And these are neurons corresponding to backward deflections of the whisker. So that's like this blue, blue is forward and red is back. And so that kind of corresponds to, so when the mouse is running fast, it often has its whiskers forward. It's kind of in this more exploratory state. And then often when the mouse isn't running, its whiskers will be more back. So that drives a lot of the, the variability across the neural population we see here. Um, and yeah, so you can do more of this analysis, um, but I'm, I'm just kind of briefly summarizing one of these things you can do by combining face map and raster map or, or just by taking um, these face map behaviors and creating a model, even if you don't have super neurons. One other thing we can do with raster map is we can color the neurons uh, based on their positions. So I have this, this is a one dimensional sorting of the neurons. And so I can color each neuron by its position here, these colors here. And you can make a plot here of this is sensory motor cortex of the mice. Um, and there, it, some of it is quite a bit jumbled, but some of it, like for example, um, when the mouse is these neurons that are less excited by running, that are more suppressed by running, often tend to be like kind of in this more lateral area, maybe this more um, anterior area. Um, so yeah, those are kind of some of the analyses you can do with this linear network. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Okay, so, but this linear network actually isn't the best prediction of uh, neural activity from behaviors, we can do better by creating a, a nonlinear network. And so that's what we did next. Um, so again, we're going to start with this linear layer from, from key points that kind of combines them. Then we have these convolutional filters to create our spatiotemporal receptive fields. This time we have a ReLU nonlinearity here, which is signified by this, this uh, symbol. And then we added two more nonlinear layers uh, here, basically fully connected linear layers followed by a ReLU nonlinearity. Um, and uh, I'll talk more about this this last hidden layer in the network, which we'll use uh, for analysis. This is a, these are what we call our deep behavioral features. Um, but then ultimately, at the output, we have the same thing. We have the neural principal components um, as our output of this model. Um, and so what we find is using um, this nonlinear method. So for example, here's here's our activity in visual cortex. Uh, this is neurons by time. This is a different recording before I was showing sensory motor cortex. We look at the prediction from the neural network. You can see that um, we're predicting a lot of, of various features in this neural network, or sorry, in the, in the underlying neuronal network of the brain. So these things look very similar. Whereas if we use a, a linear model, and actually this linear model uh, I'm showing here as an example, doesn't even have the convolutions. Um, this is the original model from our old paper. You can see that this is not doing nearly as good a job as having a model with these convolutional layers and with these um, ReLU nonlinearities. So we can now basically, this is suggesting that that there is a lot of information in the mouse brain about behaviors because this, this these things look very similar. 
we can quantify that as using a linear versus a the, the network model, the percentage of variance that we explain. And now we're up to close to 50% of the neural variance can be explained by the mouse's behaviors. Whereas in our previous paper, we are we were around a third of, of that, basically. And um, we can do that from the key points, or we can also do that from our original method where we use the movie or the motion PCs. And you can see, uh, for example, for the sensory motor areas, actually using the mo movie PCs does a little bit better um, here. So you can get a little bit more out of the features we think maybe related to the running posture, like kind of the, the neck posture and stuff of the mouse. Um, but for visual cortex, we do just as well, pretty much with the key points. Um, are there any questions here? OK, so we've created this uh, this uh, model from from behaviors to neural activity that works really well. And now we want to understand, like what I was saying before, what are these behaviors that are driving neural activity now that we've made this relationship? Um, and also we want to know kind of what are different, uh, what are the different patterns uh, of representations of these behaviors across cortex? And so that's the first thing we looked at was the spatial distribution across cortex. Um, and so we have these neurons uh, here that I'm showing. Um, we actually cluster this neural activity. That's also the first step in raster map. We can show the activity of these example neural clusters. Um, so we we have a hundred of these. I'm showing some example ones that are well predicted. So the cluster activity is is the color. So what by I mean by cluster activity, let's say a cluster has a thousand neurons. We average the activity of those thousand neurons, and then that's this activity trace we have here. And then we have the prediction of that activity trace uh, from the key points, which is shown in gray. And now we can see if there's a really what, where these clusters are across cortex. And so we found that there were some clusters that were very spread out. So like this blue and this orange cluster are very spread out across cortex. And then there were some more localized ones like this teal one and this pink one, and then some really localized clusters we found like this gray one here. And so for example, for these sensory motor clusters, if we look at their prediction versus their locality. So like this gray one is very localized. These clusters that are very localized were less well predicted by behavior. So basic, so you can see all of these clusters that are more spread out are more related to the mouse's behavior. Um, suggesting these behavioral signals are not driving like very small groups of neurons in very specific places. They're driving kind of more spread out areas of, of groups of neurons. Um, and that was also consistent in visual cortex. Uh, so this goes at the, the kind of the opposite of this statement, like the, there are groups of neurons that are really close in space that are highly correlated. They're kind of not related to behavior and sort of having their own spontaneously generated activity, we think. Um, well, these other neurons are, are supporting kind of representations of behavior across cortex. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next thing we did was we wanted to um, look at what these behaviors are that dri are driving neural activity. So um, we're going to go back to our encoding model from, from key points, behaviors to neural activity. We're going to focus on this last hidden layer, these deep behavioral features, which are 256 dimensional. So basically what these deep behavioral features are, are the projection of the behavior into the neural activity that best drives the neural activity. So it's a subset, it's not all behaviors, it's a subset of behaviors that best drive neural activity. And we're gonna try to understand these behaviors better. And so what we do for that is we fit a hidden Markov model with 50 discrete states. Um, so I don't know how many of you have, have seen these models before in, in your courses. Um, maybe they're more common than deep networks, I, I don't know. Uh, but the biases here. Um, but basically, you have these discrete states, um, the hidden states, these Zs here, um, that are predicting these deep behavioral features here, these Xs, these observed um, variables. We can also do this with key points or the neural activity as well. And so we have these deep behavioral features. I'm I'm sorting them by, by raster map again, um, but you could show them in any way. So this is features by time. This is what they look like. We can infer states like the, these underlying discrete states of these behaviors. Um, and they look something like this. And if we look at the reconstructed features, you can see that we're capturing a lot of the a lot of these 
deep behavioral features from this discretized model. And so, um, and we found 50 states was approximately kind of the best log likelihood to use. Um, using more states didn't help, basically. So we stuck with these 50 states. Okay, so we wanted to understand these 50 kind of behavioral states that the mouse is, is going through. Um, and kind of, all right, so what are their time scales? That's the first thing we did. So we found that these behaviors had time scales of around half a second to up to tens of seconds. Um, and if we, but if we look at the time scales of the key points, actually they were a bit faster. So there are faster movements, like for example, the exact whisking patterns of the mouse. Um, those don't necessarily drive neural activity, but those are represented in states that are fit to the behavior alone, these key points. Um, and this is kind of the lifetimes of, of a control where we shuffle the data. We can then look at our transition matrix. So this is the transition matrix governing Z, the transitions between these hidden states. And what we saw was that um, for the deep behavioral features, they actually seem to, so they're, they're fairly sparse. So a mouse, this kind of like, a mouse can't go from like just sitting still to running like at 100%, like really, really fast. That's kind of why these things will be sparse. But we also saw this interesting property that they were asymmetrical. So a lot of these transitions are above the diagonal. Um, so let me clarify again. So, so this is the probability of transitioning from this state to another state. That's what each of these little dots are. Um, and so you can see a lot of these dots are above the diagonal. So there's kind of these forward sequences that the mouse does. Um, so like, for example, the mouse will go from in rest, it might start grooming, a little bit, then whisking, then it will start running, kind of goes through this natural sequence of, of arousal, doesn't necessarily go backwards through it, um, in a sense. In the key points, we saw uh, we saw less asymmetry, uh, in part because a lot of these, these states are related to, like I was saying, exact whisking cycles and things like that, um, that are kind of symmetrical, like you go, you whisk forward, backwards, forward, backwards, things like that. Um, so we think we have these kinds of motifs of behaviors the mouse goes through. Um, and so I'm going to show, all right, so this is less exciting, me pretending to be a mouse, but let me show you what these states actually look like on the mouse face. So we can take time periods where the mouse is in a given state. We kind of call these trials. So you can see, for example, the trials for maybe state 40 here, and I can make videos of what the mouse is doing at those times. So here's the mouse grooming. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen a mouse groom before, but it's fairly cute. And so you can see the mouse doing these little, uh, during this grooming state that we found, um, grooming. And so this is one of the first states on that on that matrix. So like often the mouse will be at rest. I'll show that rest state in a second and then go and then groom and then start uh, behaving. This is another one of the early states. Actually, the mouse will like blink when it kind of wakes up a little bit. So you can see the the blinking here. All right, so this is pretty fast. So you might just like wanna focus on one of them and, and watch it. Uh, so you can see this is the kind of the blinking state that we found. There were a couple of these. And then this is one, there were several running states. This is the one where the mouse is running really fast. And like I was saying before, so whiskers are often very far forward when it's running fast. Um, kind of like, I think of it like you're looking in front of you when you run is kind of, I don't know if that's the best analogy, but yeah, they put their whiskers forward. And then this is the rest state, one of the rest states we found. There were two of them. This is the longest one. The mouse is mostly just sitting still. When the mouse leaves this state, you'll see it often goes into the blinking state. So you saw that there. And so so now we have these these various um, states that that actually are related to um, kind of human defined. Uh, we we can kind of define them as humans. Um, some of them are a little bit harder. There's a lot of whisking states um, that aren't so super obvious exactly what they are, but they they do look distinct across um, across states. Are there any questions here? Okay, so the next thing we did, so we have these 50 different behavioral states. So we can look at how neural populations respond to these states. And so, like I was saying before, we have these trials, of uh, basically these times when the mouse is in this state, and we look at neural activity across what we're calling these kinds of trials. And so, for example, for this state here, 
we can see, so this is the onset of the trial um, at the black line at zero. And then this is the offset of the trial, basically when the mouse leaves that state for this given state. Um, and these are the neurons that are tuned to that state. So we have training trials where we find the neurons that are best tuned to the state. And then these are test trials where we average the neurons tuned to that state and look at their activity. And so you can see that this population of neurons tuned to the state uh, respond strongly when the mouse is in the state and really are locked to the time of entering and exiting the state. We saw different things for different states. We saw for some states, for example, this state, the neurons responded more when the mouse exited that state rather than kind of the entrance to that state. We saw states like a lot of these long states actually did drive the neural population th the whole time the mouse was in the state, kind of like those neurons I was saying before that are active throughout the time the mouse is running. Um, or for example, when the mouse is not running, you have neurons that are active. Um, so we saw lots of different time scales of neural activity triggered from, from the behavior. And so just to summarize, uh, we created this fast and accurate key point tracker. We created this new encoding model for predicting neural activity from behavior. And so this is what the prediction looks like compared to the neural activity. This new model outperformed our old methods of linear prediction. We were able to use this model to identify behavioral states from this last hidden layer. We called these deep behavioral features. Um, and ultimately now we're excited about using this model to really understand the interplay between behavior, cognitive, and sensory signals. Um, and we re wrote a review on this that you can check out if you're interested um, in trying to understand better what these signals are and what they might be used for. And you can find all of the code available on GitHub for the project, the papers on BioArchive. And again, big thanks to Erika Saida who led this project. Um, and yeah, so are there any questions about face map? I had a couple of general questions. So one was, yeah, can you, yeah. is it of interest to go the other way around, to go from neural data to behavior? Yeah, definitely. Also from like the, I mean, the context of brain machine interfaces, like things like that, where people want to predict what behavior the a person is thinking about. And so um, we have done a little bit of that. And so there, there is kind of this uh, limitation, like I was saying before, like these deep behavioral features aren't everything. So we don't know exactly where the whiskers are um, from the neurons alone. They just encode like kind of forward or backwards, not like exactly where everything is. So there's some things that will be missing, um, but it kind of depends on your question. So for us, we want to know what's drive. These neurons are driven after the be or concurrently when the behavior happens. So we think they're dry they're being driven by behavior across the brain. So we're interested in that question. But I think in a motor area where the activity precedes the behavior, I think that is a really, I mean, that's that's a really interesting question to know what those patterns are, yeah. Yeah, and also all of these variance proportions are assuming that the visual input is kept constant, right? So if you vary yeah, the visual Yeah, the mouse input, is in total what, total darkness, I should say, yeah. sorry. Oh, I yeah, see. So, so the question for visual cortex is how does this proportion relate to the proportion driven by vision when you actually manipulate the stimulus itself, for example? Yeah, that's really good... the question you're asking. It's just a different question. Yeah, so there's more variance in the population about twice. It, it, so for neurons that are driven by stimuli, they'll have on average twice more variance than they would have for these behaviors. Um, but not all neurons are are driven by every visual stimulus. Um, so the overall population, they, you'll still see, um, well, the mouse is seeing these stimuli, you'll see still see lots of these behavioral patterns in the population because there are lots of neurons that aren't driven by the specific stimuli you're showing. There's a question from Paul Francois in the chat. Oh, yeah. So, okay. The nonlinear model, you have a layer with 256 nodes. What is the minimum number of nodes you can get within a layer without degrading too much the performance? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so we have a supplemental uh, supplementary figure in our paper showing that curve as a function of the number of nodes there. Um, and it definitely does help to have 256. Um, but then it, it pretty much levels off there. Um, and so, so yeah, so we think um, we need that many dimensions to kind of get a linear output to our neural activity. But like we we are able to suppress, like um, basically th this is kind of to get a linear readout, but, but we can kind of think about these things. There's these 50 underlying states. So it might not be quite so high dimensional. It's just that's how big it needs to be to be able to get a good prediction of our neural activity. 
uh, like a linear readout, if that makes sense. So it depends on how you define dimensionality. Is a good yeah. question. And actually, on exactly that note, I was wondering when you designed all these models, is it just, is it that a systematic approach? Is it intuition and expertise that you pick this structure? Is it trial and error? How does it work? Oh, yeah. A lot of it is trial and error. We'll try adding more or fewer layers. We knew the convolutional layer was really important. Um, and so we kind of have some tricks to fit that better. Like, for example, we force these convolutions here to be smooth. That's a really useful thing to help them the network fit. Um, but then deciding on these layers is kind of like trial and error. And then we went back and what you'll see in the supplement, we tried lots of perturbations to see if we did indeed find the, like basically different numbers of nodes and so on to make sure we found the best network. But yeah, that's kind really of how this research goes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a related question from Anmar about the 50 states in the Marco model. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, so um. Maybe I can show it after, but I do have the plot um, for the, I don't have it in specifically here, but we did look at the log likelihood of the model as a function of the number of states, and it seemed to saturate around 50. Um, and that's a supplementary figure now in the revised version of the paper, which will be out soon in publication. Um, but yeah, it's not in the preprint yet. But yeah, it's a good question. Also a question from Benjamin. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you mentioned, so the question is, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but can your key point tracker identify key points in a video from an angle not seen in the training data? Ah, uh, that's a really good question. Or can your model be used in the opposite uh, direction to generate some sort of rough 3D model of the mouse face? Yeah, so if the if the angle is not quite what's seen in the data, that's, I'll just, let me put back up this. Yeah, so you can see the, the angle we had here was kind of side or kind of up upwards. Those were the two angles we had. And so if you have a new angle, we have a fine tuning procedure you can use. So Attica has in the GUI, you can put in your data and you can basically train even with like 20 frames or less, you can fine tune the model for your specific view. We did find that to be important because depending on the view of the mouse face, the whiskers can look quite different. For example, those are kind of the hardest key points. Um, so yeah, that that is important an important thing we have that's in the paper and the GUI. In terms of generating a rough model of the, the mouse face in 3D, I don't think we still have enough key points for that, um, but it's an interesting idea. Um, and yeah, I think we'd also need more than one camera view at a time, which we don't have, unfortunately. Are there any other questions? Seems not. All right, so now we will go on to how did we make these pictures of, of neural activity? Um, so what we did with raster map to kind of put neurons that are correlated to each other next to each other, we combined two unsupervised approaches. So some of you might be familiar with nonlinear dimensionality reduction like TSNI or autoencoders. So you have a matrix, for example, of neurons by genes, and you make this plot um, where you basically put these neurons close to each other in this TSNI. Uh, if they have similar gene expression. So this is commonly done, uh, especially in, in the single cell RNA sequencing literature. Uh, another approach, unsupervised approach is clustering, where basically you take this high dimensional neuron by gene matrix and you find clusters of neurons that have similar gene expression. And so you can then color this TSNI plot by these cluster identities. So different colors mean different clusters. And so what you can see is that um, when you do these kinds of dimensionality reductions, uh, you don't always get preserve the high dimensional structure perfectly. Like for example, you can see mixing of these clusters here in the VIP area where they're not perfectly separated. So um, what we really wanted to make sure was that we were preserving high dimensional structure when we're creating one of these low dimensional uh, basically embeddings. So for that, we actually start by clustering our data and then do the nonlinear dimensionality reduction. So that's how RasterMap works. So we first uh, apply k-means clustering, although you could any do any kind of clustering. So what's common in single cell RNA sequencing is graph-based clustering, like the Louvain or Leiden algorithm. You could also do that. And so we do this k-means clustering. And then what we do in order to not just look at instantaneous correlations between neurons. So for example, when you apply k-means clustering, you're just looking at which neurons are correlated to each other at a single time point and putting them together. We also want to capture neurons that are similar to each other, but kind of firing maybe in a sequence, for example. So for that, we actually 
quantify the cross correlation between these clusters. So for example, between clusters 10 and 12, we can plot the correlation as a function of, we have the two cluster time traces and we can kind of slide them across each other and look at the correlation between them at different time lags. You can see the max here isn't at zero, it's maybe at four or five. And so what we do is we have, um, we can take these cluster correlations at various time lags. So we have this matrix of cluster by cluster correlations, again, from these cluster traces. Um, I should have said this before, sorry. So every every cluster is a group of like a thousand or more neurons. We average those and that gives us these cluster traces I'm referring to, which we correlate. So we correlate them at various time lags from each other and we take the maximum over positive time lags. And so if we do this, uh, we get a matrix um, that might look something like this. And now we're going to try to sort this matrix. So this is the nonlinear dimensionality reduction part, where we're going to try to put clusters next to each other if they have are, are similar to each other in this plot now. And so to do this, we're we're sort, we're gonna basically try to make this matrix look as much as possible like a matrix like this, which has this kind of power law decay off the diagonal. Um, so it's high along the diagonal and then it decays. And so that's gonna try to capture kind of global structure in the in the in the neural activity. And then we also have this other panel, uh, other matrix we add to this, which we call our traveling salesman cost, um, which is is called the parameter inside raster map is called locality. And so this can be made bigger or smaller, but this is just the first off diagonal to try to put clusters that are correlated to each other right next to each other. So if you only do locality, you only care about exactly putting clusters that are most correlated to each other next to each other. If you have some of this global weighting though, you're gonna kind of try to get globally the picture of, of neural activity. Um, and so for people who are familiar with TSNE, this is kind of like that perplexity parameter that can be vary to get more local or global embeddings. And so now um, let me show you, oops, sorry. Let me show you what this looks like in practice. So we have these clusters and what the algorithm is doing is, um, so we are solving a traveling salesman like problem. So uh, you can't solve it in closed form. So we do this iterative optimization where clusters get moved along this one dimensional embedding if, if they improve the score, basically, if they make this matrix look more like this. And then in the end, you hopefully get a matrix where things are higher along the diagonal and kind of lower off the diagonal. And you can see this asymmetry here, especially where there's sequences in this neural population. So these are little sequences of neural activity. And so then we have this sorting. What we do next is we upsample these clusters. So basically you can do some linear upsampling between nodes. So we have maybe a hundred clusters, but we want maybe a thousand positions. So we'll upsample between each of these cluster centers, maybe 10 positions, and that will give us more places to assign our neurons. So if we do that, we maybe get a, a map of where neurons are, which looks like this. This is kind of a histogram across hundreds of positions. Uh, and it's a function. This is how many neurons are at each position. And then we put these neurons at the position making a picture that looks something like this. And then what I was saying before was after we sort the neurons into these positions, we average every 50 neurons. So that gives us kind of these super neurons I was talking about. And so this gives us now a picture like this. Are there any questions about uh, how, how the raster map algorithm works? Okay. I went, I went through it pretty quickly, but maybe there'll be more questions as we see the applications. Um, so the first thing we did was test how well raster map can work on simulated data. So we simulated a neural population, which had sequences. So these two different sequences of neural activity, like, like a, sequences you would see in hippocampus, or we've also seen in visual cortex when the mouse is running through virtual reality. Um, we also had tuning neurons, like these neurons here that had different responses to uh, kind of like, you can think of orientation, oriented gratings in visual cortex we see responses to. Um, we had some activity that was meant to look like the spontaneous activity I showed you before, this power law module, and then these sustained responses like neurons which have some kind of um, time lag response to certain stimuli. And so basically raster map can find these different patterns, the super neurons, have tuned kind of like what look like place cells to these different sequences here. We can find tuning curves 
from these super neurons. We can find these different sustained responses. So we can recover all of these different uh, different modules of, of neural activity that were, I mean, of course, all mixed up and then Rastromap had to find them. If we apply this uh, the TSNI algorithm to the same data set, we see that TSNI can't kind of mixes things so you can see the sequences are kind of mixed up throughout the the um, the data set, and you can see so it does record cover some of the things well, like for example this tuning module, um, but raster map really excels at at getting these these sequences of neural activity uh, from the data set. So we quantified this by making a plot of basically this is the ground truth position of the neuron based on the simulation versus the embedding position. You can see raster map is making these clean sequences, whereas TSNI kind of struggles with, with this. Um, and so does UMAP. Um, and also ISOMAP and, and Laplace and Eigenmaps are not as good. These are some of the older um, embedding algorithms that people have used in the past that, that have inspired a lot of this other work. OK, so we quantify kind of how well raster map is doing uh, by saying, let's say if we have this this sequence here of neurons, we hope we want to see if we have a sequence A, B, C, we want to know if neuron B is always correctly placed between A and C. So we quantify kind of this triplet score. And so higher is better. And we found the percent correct triplets was always higher for raster map in black than these other algorithms, which is apparent from basically the fact that these sequences are split here. Um, for the contamination score, we were looking to see if neurons are put in, if neuron B, for example, in the sorting is in a different module from A or C. And so what we found was, so lower is better here. So we found that raster map generally put neurons together that were in the same module and, and basically had other neurons from other modules put in different places in the embedding, whereas these other algorithms kind of struggled with that, um, especially in kind of the sequences again. Are there any questions about that? OK, so this is the boring part where you benchmark your algorithm. But then we can also look at pictures of, of so RasterMap is a visualization tool to try to better find patterns in the data. So looking at this applied to various data sets. So for example, this is neural activity collected while a mouse runs through a virtual corridor. So it runs through this leaf's corridor here, um, where it's rewarded, which those reward times are shown with these green lines. And then it also runs through these circle corridors where the mouse doesn't get a reward. Um, in, in mouse visual neuroscience, this reward is like a drop of water that the mouse gets on a lake port in front of it. And so the time points when the mouse is in the blue circles corridor is in blue. Then in the leaves corridor, this is in green. And what we can do, for example, we can make tuning curves of the neurons uh, from the raster map here. And so you can see these clear tuning curves. Um, and one, one nice thing too with raster map is these the rewards we deliver them at random times. So if we averaged over trials, we'd struggle to understand this data because we don't have things happening at the same time all the time. But because we're averaging over neurons, we can we can see single trial activity and kind of un try to understand that activity a lot better, which is which is what we've been doing and discovering new patterns in this neural activity we, we weren't expecting to see before we had made these kinds of plots. We have also applied this, um, this algorithm to data such as um, data from rat hippocampus. So these are recordings uh, done while a rat runs through a linear corridor. Um, so you can see the X position of the rat here, um, the running speed, so these time periods when the exposition is changing a lot, that's when the rat is running running back and forth. And you can see these sequences that a raster map can find of neural activity through these corridors. So these now we're not making super neurons, we're sorting single neurons. So the algorithm can, instead of clustering first, can just directly take single neurons and sort those. And so that's what we're doing here. And so again, you can do the same kind of thing where you can really look at single trials and see if there are certain things happening on single trials that might be different or, or similar um, and actually kind of try to pin those down uh, in a way that maybe wouldn't be as easy if you looked across trials. Um, and so here also are the single neuron tuning curves sorted that have been sorted here. And so you can see, again, we can see this the 
tuning curves that kind of tile the, the corridor. You can also see neurons that are specific for kind of the end of one corridor versus uh, the end of another corridor um, that, I mean, which are the same place as this, but that's kind of a nice way you can see these things easily and when you make a plot like this. Another thing that we found was that we didn't tell RasterMap any of this information, but by it, it just basically based on the neural uh, activity, it found that the fast spiking neurons, these putative inhibitory neurons were all put together in the RasterMap. Um, and then the regular spiking excitatory neurons were put separately. We can also look at uh, neural activity relating to behaviors. So I showed this before. This is neurons by time and the spontaneous activity where the mouse is in total darkness. Uh, again, I showed you that neural activity is uh, can be colored on the cortex based on its sorting here. We can relate this neural activity to the behaviors, which makes this plot uh, like this of the prediction of neural activity from behavior. So. Uh, and then what I showed you before was then we can look at these behavioral receptive fields sorted across these, across the raster map and try to understand these things better. Another another uh, analysis we did in the paper was we looked at data from the Musil Kaufman et al. study from 2019 where they did wide field imaging while the mouse does a decision making task. So this is the mouse brain. Um, this is kind of like olfactory areas and then sensory motor and then you have visual cortex back here. And so this coloring is how raster map organizes these pixels on in these voxels now. These are not single neurons, these are voxels uh, like fMRI if people are familiar with that. Um, and raster map can also find organization of these voxels a lot uh, across cortex. Um, we can look at this uh, we can then make this picture of voxels by time and look at different populations. For example, um, these neurons here are responding when the mouse sees a visual stimulus, this, this light blue color. And you can see these neurons here on the brain. They're in visual cortex. That's good. And same thing, this is another visual cortex, visual uh, stimulus. And then these neurons are here. Um, and actually, I'm pointing out these visual stimuli because the in, in the study, what they did was they looked at the mouse's behavior. Um, so whisking, sniffing, licks, handles, and all of these things. Um, and they related these, uh, they related the task variables like the choice and the visual stimulus and also the behavior to the mouse's neural activity. And one thing you can do with raster map is visualize these two predictions. So for example, they predicted neural activity, uh, if you predict from both task and behavioral variables, you can predict a lot of the neural activity. Um, this is the prediction you can see compared to the real data. These are very similar. Um, if you predict from behavioral variables only, you actually see a decrease in prediction in this area here, which is visual cortex. If I take the difference, it's more clear here. So you can see exactly these visual stimuli, which are not predicted from the behavior of the mouse. So by doing this raster map, you can start to kind of tease apart which things are driven by behaviors, which aren't, um, and hopefully get a better understanding of your data. Um, we can also show, we can also sort neural activity from zebrafish. So you can record tens of thousands of neurons simultaneously in a zebrafish uh, while you're showing different stimuli, such as these phototactic stimuli or those optomotor response stimuli. You can look at how fast the fish is swimming um, during these stimuli. Um, and you can then make the same plot I was making before where you have different colors across across um, across this y-axis again, and I have just kind of colored this. These are the neurons in group one, two, three, and so on. And you can see localization of some of these different patterns, which can be interesting if you're a zebrafish person. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of a nice, nice looking plot. Um, the last thing we did was we looked at if we can apply this algorithm to artificial neurons. So we can look at um, neurons that are playing various games, such as uh, this artificial network that's playing this Space Invaders game. And we can also see patterns of sequences in this in these artificial neurons as well that we can find with raster map. Uh, here's an artificial agent playing um, playing Sequest. It's actually not very good at Sequest if you know what you're supposed to do in Sequest. Uh, but you can see, again, these sequences of neural activity that we found. And actually, the value neurons 
there, there's two networks here, a value network and a convolutional network. And these are the convolutional neurons and these are more of the value neurons here. Um, and I am, should I, should I wrap up now? Um, no, I mean, you can, you have some time. You have four or five minutes if you want. Okay, so I'll show the last thing then uh, quickly. This is the last figure. Um, so we wanted to know what happens with data sets with higher intrinsic dimensionality. So for example, uh, a lot of times we, I mean, neuroscience, one of the things we look at are like these ring attractor networks where you have kind of one intrinsic dimension of neurons, like those tuning curves I showed you. Um, the embedding dimension here is two. That's that's how many neurons are being used to embed this uh, or, or how many dimensions you need to embed this manifold. Um, you can have embedding dimensions that are bigger, but still just have an intrinsic dimension of one, just this kind of curve that you follow. Um, you can have more intrinsic dimensions uh, in in higher embedding dimensions. And what we see like is, is that, it, it, for example, in this simulation here, we had these sequences and these other different patterns. Um, but if you ask, what is the intrinsic dimensionality of this of this simulation? It's actually still just one. Like all of these neurons are along the single axis um, that varies. They're they're not higher dimensional than that intrinsically. And so, um, if those kinds are if these are the kinds of patterns you're looking for, then then raster map can can help you to visualize these things. Um, but sometimes the data has higher intrinsic dimensionality, or we think often it does. But but maybe you, it will be difficult to find it with just this this sorting here. And so what we did was we tried to um, optimize raster map for data sets with higher intrinsic dimensionality. So for example, we can simulate neurons instead of before we were simulating neurons on a one dimensional, on this one dimensional axis that were sequences, power law, these other things that were just one dimensional. We can make a two dimensional simulation where neurons are now drawn by this two dimensional grid here. And these are the principal components uh, of these of these neurons. So each neuron is has these weights corresponding to these positions, where its position is in this 2D map. Um, and these are what these weights look like. If we try to sort this neural activity with raster map, with the original raster map, you can see we do kind of get this kind of snake looking sequence throughout this two dimensional space. Um, and, but looking at this, we we were thinking we were kind of inspired that maybe we can use kinds of these ideas um, from fractals where you create these space filling curves where you can do better by kind of splitting things and going deeper and splitting things and going deeper. So that's actually what we do. And we have an extension to raster map where you split, you actually cluster and then split and then cluster again and then split and keep doing this. And then you can get a sorting that looks like this where you can get this kind of finer sorting of things. And so comparing this to TSNI, we can capture a lot more of the, of the local, um, we can ca capture the local neighborhood of neurons much better doing this. Um, it's still, okay, so again, at the end of the day, you're still embedding something that's two-dimensional and one-dimensional. It's still not gonna be the best picture of things, but it's one way you can at least make a picture of your data. Um, but in practice, you have to, think hard about what you're doing with data with with this uh, with a uh, uh, high intrinsic dimensionality. Um, so we did apply this to visual responses in mice where we show mice many different visual stimuli. And we look at these are the these are neurons by stimuli by, by time here. You can see the stimuli being shown at these times here, the running speed here. We can color these neurons by raster map. We see primary visual cortex here. Higher order visual areas are, are up here. We look at the sorting, we can see neurons. So these neurons here happen to have bigger receptive fields. These are in these higher order visual areas. These are the neurons put at this higher part of the plot. And then we have the kind of smaller receptive fields, which uh, some of them are in, for example, primary visual cortex, um, some of these smaller ones here. And we can kind of see this arrangement. So this is like going down the plot like this, all the way down through the embedding. You can see some structure. But this is again kind of a also a warning. Like you don't necessarily want to, um, you want to be careful with embedding techniques if you have high intrinsic dimensionality because you're still going to be missing things in your data by doing doing an analysis like this. Like we're just kind of getting this kind of rotation of these receptive fields. 
it might be helpful to visualize your data initially, but but generally you are going to want to try to do different analyses to ultimately understand your data. And so in summary, I've shown you, you can use raster map on a lot of different data sets. So please try it out and let us know how it goes. We're happy to answer GitHub issues. Um, and just summarize, here's everyone in, in our lab. And thanks, thanks to all of them for their help with these projects. And we have a lot of support at Genelia, which makes doing science here really great. And we have, so we have postdoc positions, as I was saying, and also group leader positions available at Genelia. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. We have time for maybe one or two questions quickly, if anyone has any hands or in between, I'll quickly ask something like, is there some kind of limit on how many neurons you need to apply? So what is the size of data set that this can be applied to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you couldn't, you can sort as few as 20 neurons in the, in this, let me go back to this. This is the low, the smallest data set we used uh, was this one here. This is uh, a little over a hundred neurons. So and they're not simultaneous, right? Or do they have to be? These simultaneous. are simultaneous. These are simultaneous. Okay. So another option is if you have PSTHs across a task, you could sort those PSTHs. You could have neurons by PSTH, and then those don't necessarily have to be coincident. So that's another option you could do. That's really cool. Um, any other questions? OK, it looks like people are digesting it. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. And yeah, that, that was great. That was a great one two set of talks. Thanks, so thanks, everybody, and thanks, Carson. Thanks for your time, everybody.